Okay, great. I think we can get started here. Thank you all for joining us today on this panel on COVID-19 and the future of cities. My name is Martina Kirchberger and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Economics at Trinity College Dublin. This event is the first in a series run by Trinity Research in Social Sciences in collaboration with member schools. And today we're going to talk an important question arising out of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is what is the future of cities? Now, there are many open questions, so I just want to highlight some of the questions that appear first order when we want to start thinking about the effect of COVID-19 on cities. Now, cities have increasingly been valued not only for produ their production, but also the consumption possibilities that they offer. So what will happen to the demand for living in cities when we remove or strongly regulate the consumption of these amenities that involve around social interaction, such as going to restaurants, concerts, theaters, parks, or also the unplanned encounters Jane Jacobs often referred to. On the production side, what is the effect of this accelerated movement to work remotely on the productive advantages of cities? And will this fear of contagion combined with experiences in working from home permanently change people's preferences to cluster? Now, one feature of cities has been inequality and the pandemic has particularly highlighted the different experiences so far for those who can work safely from home and keep their job, those who have to go out to work to survive and they live in crowded locations and those who have neither work nor home. And it has highlighted who are the essential workers. So the question is whether this current experience will change anything in the way we think about inequality in cities. Now, the answers to all of these questions are probably strongly dependent on whether we view this pandemic as a one-off event. And it remains to be seen how they would change if pandemics become more regular and also what type of investments would be required by cities to ensure that they remain desirable places to live. Will this change the way cities are government, governed? And finally, as a development economist working on cities in low-income countries, a key question to me is whether and how this will differentially affect cities and the opportunities that they offer in low-income countries. Now, we're not going to be able to provide an answer to all of these open questions today, but hopefully we can provide some insights on to how to think about this question. So I'm really delighted to welcome on this panel Ed Glazer, Jesse Handbury, and Diego Puger, three brilliant urban economists who are also directly involved in different ways in looking at COVID-19. Ed Glazer is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard University. Ed has published extensively on the determinants of city growth and the role cities play as centers of ideas transmission. He's very much coined this term of consumer city, the idea that cities play an increasingly important role for consumption. Many of you probably read his book, Triumph of the City, and some of his recent work examines how COVID-19 has affected small businesses. Jesse Handbury is an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and some of her research has shown that consumers in cities face much greater variety of grocery products and prices are not necessarily higher in larger cities. And more recently, she's developed an exposure index based on smartphone app location data to help analysis during this current pandemic and will share with us some really interesting findings that are starting to emerge. Diego Puga is Professor of Economics at SEMFI and he's on the multidisciplinary working group advising the Spanish government on COVID-19. His research has shown how cities make workers and firms more productive and the first sentence in his recent paper, The Economics of Density, is everybody loves density. So of course the paper presents a much more nuanced view and in the end the authors reflect on how even the writing of the paper was affected uh, by this current pandemic. And it would be interesting to see how and whether your experience um, has shifted your view on cities. So thank you very much to all of you for, for taking time out of your busy schedules to be part of this panel. Now the format of the event is as follows. Each of the panel members has agreed to present for about 15 minutes, and then we will open it up for a Q&A. Diego will go first as he has an important meeting with the office of the Deputy Prime Minister. So please submit questions to Diego in the first 15 minutes and we'll take this immediately after his talk and then Ed will present and Jesse will present and we'll have the general Q&A. 
Please submit your questions in the Q&A window that you find in the middle of the screen and state your full name when submitting the question. And you're welcome to submit questions throughout. We'll try to come back to as many questions as possible. And if you have a directed uh, question that you'd like to direct at one of the panel members, please just mark clearly to whom you'd like to address the question. And finally, please note that the event is recorded. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Diego Puga now. Great, thank you. Thanks, Martina, for organizing this. It's great to be here with, with all of you, uh, with Ed and Jesse and, and Martina, and thank you all for, for attending as well. Um, so yeah, let me share my, my slides. Um, so as Martin was mentioning, you know, uh, recently we've been, you know, we just actually posted, just posted the, this paper on the economics of density uh, for the general economics perspectives written with, with Gilles de Renton. Uh, and they've written before really this COVID-19 crisis. So there's a bit uh, of it about disease uh, based on uh, past epidemics. Uh, but regarding the current pandemic, there's really just uh, like a postscript, a couple of, of paragraphs in the, in the conclusion about it. So uh, it's more about, you know, things that we've seen before about the benefits and cost of, of density uh, coming from before the, this crisis. So we know, of course, that density has many benefits it boosts productivity and innovation, it improves access to goods and services, uh, makes us build and, and move around in more energy efficient ways, allows us to share amenities as well. Uh, but density also has costs, uh, partly uh, living in, in denser cities, moving around denser cities is more costly, but partly also living in cities, in dense cities, uh, makes you more exposed to pollution and right now also to, to disease. Um, so historically, of course, a pandemic spread huge cost of density, right? So just to steal from, from Ed, uh, he's much better words on this. You know, he's, he's uh, said many times that density has both angels and, and demons, and that perhaps uh, pandemics were the worst of, of demons in, in the past, right? So pandemics hit cities very hard for centuries, you know, from the bubonic plague to cholera, tuberculosis, the 1918. The flu, and nevertheless, cities have not disappeared on the country. They have adapted to these pandemics, and urbanization has kept advancing at a very fast pace. Now, in the current pandemic, we've seen COVID-19 also hit very hard some very large, dense metropolises like New York, London, Milan, Madrid. So, this naturally raises the question of whether this is a step back to past times when pandemics were a huge cost of being in, in cities. Are the cost of density going to become uh, much greater than they were, say, a year ago? Uh, is the impact of, of uh, the disease really very different in dense cities versus smaller towns or rural areas? And how will cities adapt and survive to, to the current uh, crisis? Right. So these questions are, are difficult to to answer, partly because you know we were just talking about this when we started the uh, this meeting. It's actually very difficult to to see still at this stage what's happening, partly because the uh, pandemic is still evolving. So what we're seeing still is the relatively early phases. So we're seeing the places that are being hit first, but not necessarily the ones that are going to be hit hardest at the, at the end of the day. Partly also because the data is still scarce, right? So uh, it's still being, being built. Uh, for instance, there's not been a lot of testing. Uh, testing that's been happening and reserve people with more symptoms, so it's certainly not representative of the, of the old population and so on. Now this is changing, and you know, here in Spain in particular, now for the first time we have actually quite uh, good data on how the uh, COVID-19 has uh, spread uh, to different places. So there's been a, a surprevalent study of a representative random sample of the entire population, uh, where uh, the Statistical Institute has selected this random sample, they've asked people to take a test. And actually most people, uh, a large majority have accepted to, to do this. And in fact, close to 90% have even taken a, a full blood sample. So they've actually done the LISA type tests, which are much more reliable. So we actually now are starting to get a, a fuller picture of where uh, COVID-19 has hit the hardest, right? So uh, using that data that just came out these last few days, yesterday I put together this, this picture which 
is actually quite surprising, right? So in the vertical axis of this graph, we have precisely the, the prevalence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in the population. So this is the percentage of people that have already been infected uh, and generated uh, antibodies. On the horizontal axis, I have a measure of density. In this case, it's not you know, a traditional measure of density. We could have people per square kilometer and will make a big difference, but this is a measure of density that I think is more relevant, both in thinking about uh, contagion, but also in thinking about also the good size of density, like productivity explorers and so on, which is how many people does the average person have within a 10 kilometer radius of, of them, right? So this is what we call experience uh, density. So you can see here that Madrid and Barcelona, in fact, have a very high prevalence of uh, uh, the virus, uh, so much higher than the average uh, rate for the country of, of 5%. So Madrid is actually around 11%, a bit lower in Barcelona. But when you look overall at all of these places, um, the relationship is not very strong. And if anything, you know, the, the, the correlation is actually negative. Uh, this is because you have this whole bunch of places there on the, on the top left, uh, which are rural uh, uh, or at least sparsely populated places that, can, that still have been hit by the, uh, the virus even harder than the big densities. Now, for those of you who are not very familiar with, with Spain, let me say that these are not suburbs of Madrid or, or Barcelona. These places are far away. So getting to Soria or Albacete, this is not something you would want to do daily for your commute. This is something that takes several hours. So people do go there for the weekend. So there are people from these places who live in Madrid and then go back home to spend the weekend in a second home. There are people from Madrid that have second homes there and go there as well. There are couples that work in different cities and then get together for the weekend. So there's actually quite a lot of travel between these places, but these are places that are far away and are not very dense. So this second diagram I'm going to show you, this is actually from a recent paper just posted a few days ago by Masoli, Matteo, Hernando, Meloni, and Romasco, where they also combine this uh, prevalence of antibodies data uh, with some mobility data, similar to the one Jesse has been using for the US. So this is based on, on uh, pings by cell phone applications that allow to see how people move around in the country. So now the vertical axis is still the prevalence of antibodies, but the horizontal axis is now the number of weekend stays either from people who regularly live in Madrid and went to each of these provinces on the weekend, or people who live in these provinces and then went to Madrid on the weekend. And there, now you can see a very, a much stronger uh, positive uh, relationship where the places that have hit, been hit the hardest are actually these places that we saw in the previous diagram are not very dense, uh, but are very strongly connected to Madrid, which is where the outbreak started in, in Spain. And in fact, if, if instead of just looking at these variables one by one and, and plotting these correlations, you do some kind of multivariate analysis, uh, you know, about 64% of the uh, variation, this is what this uh, study by Masoli and co-author shows, about 64% is explained by mobility and only about 3% by density, right? So in the end, what this, what this suggests is that there's something that has changed with respect to past epidemics. Uh, we are much more connected these days. And this is partly uh, in the form of these big metropolitan areas being connected to the rest of the world. And this is part of the reason why New York, London, Milan, Madrid were hit first. Uh, this connection with the rest of the world uh, planted uh, the seed of the virus there early on. But then widespread mobility within the country also disseminates the virus very quickly to smaller towns and rural areas. So in the end, it's not the densest places that get hit the hardest. It's actually low density places that are well connected to high density cities that end up being hit the hardest. So why, why even harder? I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that mobility can make these places be hard hit as well. But why even harder than the big cities? Uh, this is something we don't know yet and I haven't seen any study on this, but so this is just, just a conjecture on my side. But I think it's probably a combination of those two things. I mean, on the one hand, this, uh, this kind of weekend trips are trips that tend to be more social in the sense that people go there and go out to restaurants and interact more and that may be part of what's going on. Uh, but also, I think there's some kind of threshold effect in terms of social distancing. So when you're in a big city, uh, 
you bump into a lot of people, most of whom you don't know, and it becomes quite standard to actually do the last six feet of separation, right? To uh, cross the sidewalk when you are uh, uh, about to uh, go against someone or to wear face masks. Whereas in, in more rural, less dense places, you bump less frequently into people and when you bump into someone, it's almost always someone who you know. So this, this final six meter of separation is actually harder to do. And I think that may be partly what's going on. Also, I mean, these numbers are only about uh, people getting infected. They don't really deal with the consequences of getting infected. It may also be that in these rural places, health facilities are also not as well prepared. So in fact, the uh, health consequences of, of the condition of being infected may also be harder in less dense uh, and more rural places. So, you know, I wanted to start by that, just saying that although we have this presumption that density actually increases prevalence of COVID-19, that's not necessarily the case, or at least not as, stronger, as, as strongly as we, as we thought. But nevertheless, this doesn't mean that cities are not going to get hit hard by, by this pandemic, because even if there's necessarily more prevalence, cities do rely much more on uh, the interactions. Uh, cities do rely much more on this productivity spillovers, on this meeting other people. So in that sense, since we now require lots of social distancing to try to keep the disease under control, cities may get more strongly affected by this. And yet, I have the impression that, you know, I'm pretty sure that the need for densities will not go away. This is partly because although more, many of us are trying to work remotely as much as possible right now, this is not feasible in many occupations and, and sectors. And for instance, work by Dingle and, and Neyman recently shows this uh, for, for the US. Also, there are spillovers, right? So you may be working for a firm that's well prepared to work remotely, but if you're dealing with other firms that are not as well prepared, it ends up being very difficult. Also, even for occupation sectors where it's feasible, uh, teleworking is actually an imperfect substitute for face-to-face -face interactions, right? So, uh, you know, we see this, you know, when we, we, those of, of us who's, who have been teaching recently, you know, when you connect to Zoom with your students, this thing that you normally do of just, just scanning their faces when you're teaching, trying to figure out whether they're following or not, seeing where you need to stop, when you need to clarify something, those nuances are, are lost in, in Zoom, right? So as much as the technology has improved, it's still not the same as being face to face. But also, I think even more importantly, uh, when we connect with someone to, with, through Zoom or through Skype or whatever, it's something that we do on purpose with anything that we intentionally uh, seek. And much of what we get from being in this environment is actually chance meetings. It's, it's, it's a BDPD of, of uh, dense environments that actually also get lost when we are, are teleworking. Um, uh, and you know, uh, besides that also, uh, density is something that we seek not just for work, but also for, for amenities. And actually it's the people who uh, have a, a high stability to, to telework, right? Uh, the workers of uh, Twitter, who Dorsey has told they can actually keep teleworking for forever. Well, those are precisely the people who may not want to be in a remote rural area because maybe they can telework, but they may still want to go to restaurants and, and bars and meet uh, other uh, people like them, right? And, and Jesse's work with Victor Couture actually has shown that uh, amenities actually are a very strong pull for uh, young uh, skilled workers in attracting them uh, to cities. Also, you know, then cities are about interacting with people, but also uh, work by Bushel and, and Borelitz uh, shows that this is not so much about the quantity of contacts, but more about the quality of contacts. It's not that we don't, it's not that so much that we interact with more people in cities, but it's that we benefit more for these interactors because since we can interact with more people potentially, we become more selective about who we interact with and we end up benefiting more from each of those interactions. Finally, also in terms of hardship, and there's lots of people undergoing very strong economic hardship these days, urban opportunities are a very strong pull and that's been the case in past pandemics. It's also probably still the case in this one. So finally, just, just to conclude on this, uh, how will cities uh, adapt? Well, uh, we've seen in the past that pandemics have shaped uh, the built environment. This is something that, for instance, uh, Colomina has been uh, working on and, and you know, things you know, from, from sewage and, and 
water treatment to urban parks to the way uh, buildings are built. That's partly been shaped by past pandemics. Uh, the current pandemic is also forcing us to make at least temporary adaptation to cities. So many cities are trying to expand the space that we serve for pedestrians as opposed to cars by closing uh, highways, going close to cities, by uh, closing big avenues, by having more green areas. Now, it's possible that these changes may persist. I actually don't think that is very, very likely, but certainly this might be uh, a nice cue to actually think about it at least and, and try to reserve uh, a bit more space for people relative to, to cars. And on the topic of cars, you know, we might expect that at least while uh, the pandemic is hitting strong, we might expect people to try to avoid subways and buses and try to take the car uh, more frequently. However, the issue of cars versus public transport is tricky because on the one hand, cars will seem safer to people, but on the other hand, people who take cars also behave differently from people who take public transport, right? Because when you take the subway, you have to incur some fixed costs. It takes some time to go to the uh, subway station uh, to wait for the uh, train to arrive. So once you incur that cost, you want to take as much advantage of that trip as possible. So people who travel by public transit tend to uh, do more focused trips. They tend to do everything close to their destination and they don't move around as much. People who go by car, they go to one place, they drive a few kilometers and they stop another place and then another place. So they are much more likely to be super spreaders in a way, right? So that doesn't say that we will see less driving, we'll probably see more, but certainly it says that there's a tension between the private and the social. So privately, we may have an incentive to take the car more often. Socially, it may be a bad thing because it actually may make the disease spread more widely. Uh, finally, you know, there's an important issue, and that is that while we've, you know, I've shown you some graphs at the beginning suggesting that it's not densities that are being hit particularly hard, we have seen that unequal cities, on the other hand, are being hit very hard. There's a much greater impact of uh, COVID-19, both in terms of health consequences, but also in terms of economic consequences for those people who have lower skills, lower income for minorities. We see that within cities, for instance, the work of Almagro and Arrange Hutchinson for New York City neighborhoods, we also see that across cities, right? So very unequal cities matter more for COVID-19 than the very dense cities. Uh, so perhaps something that we should learn is that while we still need density and we shouldn't reduce the density of cities, we may try to address the inequalities of cities and then acting on that front may actually help uh, alleviate the consequences of this and, and maybe future uh, pandemics. And this is important, of course, for those who are being hit hardest by this crisis, for people who are maybe are not hit as hard, but still care, but even, you know, even, even for someone who might uh, not care uh, directly, it's going to be hard to escape the consequences. When you are in, you know, in an area where many people are being hit hard, wanted or not, it's going to get to you as well, one way or another, right? So it is important for everyone to try to tackle this. And I think if anything, if there's anything that we learn about cities from this crisis, is that trying to reduce these inequalities may actually help us deal with this crisis and also make cities more resilient for the future. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. You seem to be muted, Martina. One classic. Huh? Uh, one thing that we can do live, another example, um, in addition to looking at our students' faces, is give a round of applause. So that would have been nice if we had, could be able to do that. Um, I would be interested to hear your views on inequality, Ed. I think you've been a defender that city shouldn't be um, sorry about that. Um, but I want to give a chance uh, to some of the questions that have been coming up uh, from the audience before Diego has to leave. And we have one Matthew nudging uh, who says, 
While cities will, of course, remain important as COVID presenting an opportunity for governments to invest in underdeveloped rural areas. For instance, government could support broadband, allowing firms to relocate to rural areas. Um, yeah, so there's, there's certainly some cost. I mean, I'm, you, you can probably see I'm in some rural area now and, and still not have the best of the connections uh, today. So certainly those, those things uh, do matter. Now to, to what extent we can actually get uh, many activities to be done uh, remotely, however, uh, is something that, that's very, very limited precisely because you know, density has advantages and, and also disadvantages. So certainly, you know, we will have to, looking at these numbers that I showed before about how some of these low density places are being hard hit, it certainly says we should think about, you know, the way, for instance, we provide healthcare to these places and making sure that there's enough facilities uh, nearby because when uh, big cities hit hard, you can build a, uh, an improvised hospital that provides temporary accommodation for the new cases. In rural areas, it's much more difficult to do those, those sort of things. So certainly there's, uh, there's a, a need and a, and a reason for doing those, those things. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is not just something about providing some government intervention that we suddenly make it feasible to do the things that we normally see in cities in rural areas. We can facilitate that to some extent, but in the end, we still need cities and we will need to be, be able to see how we can adapt cities to keep them working as opposed to, to moving away from them, I think. Okay, great. There's another question that says by Roland Lyons, do you think that if implemented unconditional income supports would undermine or reinforce the tendency of people to go to bigger cities when looking for employment? Uh, I'm not sure it's going to affect as much the location, uh, the location decision. Uh, in terms of being in one place or, or another. I mean, provided, you know, this, this, uh, these policies are not implemented in a way that's, that's necessarily tied to a place of, of residence, right? And that has been housing, uh, writing about this, this uh, local policies uh, uh, recently as well. So really what we don't want is to create distortions where you, to need, in order to get these guaranteed incomes, you need to stay put because you actually want to allow people to, to seek opportunities wherever they are. So as long as we decide these policies are that they're neutral, and I think they should be. I don't think they will have a strong effect in terms of making people locate in one place or, or, or another. But that's certainly, you know, they are important tools, especially at this, uh, at this, at this time, directly important. It's going to be something that that many countries are doing, and, and it's helping alleviate. Uh, so that's one of the, of the policies that's been quite in, important here in Spain locally. Uh, uh, flexible, uh, making uh, job flows more flexible has also been something that's been quite important in terms of keeping uh, uh, job relationships active as opposed to having people going into unemployment. And it's actually been very, very effective in terms of not having the unemployment rise, rise too much. Not the difficulty is trying to ease the transition, but even that it's being made more flexible. So certainly that's another aspect besides some uh, guaranteed income that's actually helping a lot smooth uh, the, the impact as well. Um, we have one question, Kian McLaughlin, would it be feasible for transit authorities to restrict capacity by restricting entry to, for example, subway stations? Yes, we'll have to, to figure out ways to do this, right? So one of the things we've seen is that in many places, actually, capacity has been reduced, right? Because not people, many people are using it, and maybe they want to discourage people from, from using public transport for a while. But of course, if you reduce capacity, then you make it more, more congested, right? So for a while, we're going to certainly have to find ways to make using public transport uh, uh, better, right? Some differences we've seen actually are already indicative of this, right? So a huge percentage of bus drivers in New York City have actually been infected. Very few bus drivers in Madrid have been infected. One of the differences is actually the physical layout of the buses. Where already before COVID-19, there was a, a transparent screen uh, of metacrylat separating the driver from the passengers in the Madrid buses. And I think that small change, that small difference, has made a huge impact in terms of, say, bus drivers, for instance, having a safer uh, work environment. Right. So there's small things 
that maybe we can do that may have a, a big impact in terms of making public transport is still usable and, and feasible as we as we try to move out of this lockdown Okay, probably I'll ask uh, one more question. Gary Lynch is wondering, you mentioned that some companies are extending their work from home provisions indefinitely. Do you think demand for a central business district space may change as companies move to virtual offices um, or room renting? I think we may see more what, we, what we've seen once it is having hit hard, right? So after September 11th, we saw many firms setting up like secondary sites in places that they thought would be temporarily safer, but few of them have actually moved permanently away, right? So we, we saw firms having a secondary offices that could allow them to operate securely away from Manhattan, but they haven't left their uh, headquarters in, in Manhattan, right? And I think we will see probably more preparation in terms of uh, temporary uh, measures of being able to uh, to work remotely uh, when things are needed. We may see some of the meetings that are done in person being done remotely, uh, but I don't think this is going to be the end of central business districts. I think there are especially many activities that really require this regular face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, and I don't think we're going to see central cities uh, die in, in any way. I think cities have adapted in the past to pandemics. Uh, they have reacted and they have come back stronger. I think they will come back stronger this time as well. Okay, that's a great, uh, that's a great positive note. Um, Ed, uh, the floor is yours. I don't know whether you want to briefly talk about or react to inequality specifically, or you want to go straight to your talk. Um, as you uh, it's, it's a great question. I think we will come back to it. Um, but I, I, I really just want to start by thanking you, thanking Ronan, thanking all the participants for being, uh, for being here. Uh, this topic is so important. It's such a sort of remarkable period uh, in uh, the history of, of the world and the history of cities. And it's wonderful to have this conversation. I, I want to start. Um, it's also wonderful to be on this call with, with you know, three urban economists, all of whom I admire uh, deeply. Um, I want to start with this picture of death rates in New York City over the past 200 years. And uh, the reason why I'm putting this up is uh, it's really crucial that we start our grasp of COVID in cities by recognizing how unusual the past century has been. For almost all of human history, cities have been more or less killing fields. Right? Contagion spread along the nodes of the global transportation network. According to Thucydides, it came out of Ethiopia into Egypt and then struck Athens in, in 430 BCE. And then, of course, it spreads within cities. And as Diego has just shown us, it, to show, it spreads also to those cities that are connected uh, to the large cities that are the nodes. Um, we have remarkably had a century of urban health. Right? And whereas a boy born in 1900 in New York City could expect to live three years less than the national average, um, today, sorry, could expect to live six years less than the national average in 1900. Today, life expectancies are, are more than two years longer in New York uh, than, than elsewhere, at least until COVID-19 uh, hit. Um, this did not happen easily. As you can see, the great uh, pandemic that was killing in 19th century American cities was cholera, which is a waterborne plague. And American cities only became safe because they spent as much on water and sanitation as the national government spent on everything except for the post office uh, and the army. Now, the COVID shock, of course, is a health shock that is then turned into an incredible economic dislocation, right? We have in the US, and that's true in many other places as well, the highest unemployment rate we've seen since uh, essentially the Great Depression. Um, and the reason for that is that we've seen a transition of people who have worked, you know, increasingly in occupations that are deeply vulnerable to a person-to-person -person, uh, pandemic, deeply vulnerable to any fears about interpersonal uh, physical connection. So there's this arc of employment from farms to factories to urban service workers, and those urban service workers are exactly on the front lines of this. Um, in some sense, if you sort of think about it, our human ability to bring pleasure to people who are around us, to, to serve a latte or a cappuccino with a smile and thereby find employment was both the one safe haven to, to robots, to mechanization, the one place where less skilled workers throughout the world could find a job, and yet it has placed them exactly in the most vulnerable position possible. Um, 
This just shows the path of employment uh, in the major sectors across the United States over the past 20 years. Um, the, the blue line that you can see that's dropping, of course, is manufacturing. Uh, America still does plenty of manufacturing, but it's done largely with machines. It's done with, with you know, deep capital intensive uh, enterprises, and they by and large are relatively non-urban in the 21st century, in part because they tend to be very space intensive, where Henry Ford used only uh, 20 square meters per worker in uh, 1920 to, to uh, have his workers in his factories. Today, it's quite common to have 200 square meters per worker in a, in a heavy goods manufacturing plant. Um, the line that is uh, orange is the economic engine, the export service engine of cities, and that's professional and business services. So these are lawyers and accountants, financial activities are closely related. These are occupations which traffic in knowledge, and many of them can continue going even though there's, there's COVID, maybe less effectively certainly, but their jobs are still there, they're teaching, they're doing webinars, they're connecting uh, uh, through the internet. The big green line that's rising are education and health service workers. These ones are tied down by the government and these jobs are pretty safe from economic dislocation, although they're also, many of them are also on the front lines for, for transmission of disease. Um, it's the two lines in, in the middle, the third and fourth lines that I want you to look at. They're growing. One is retail trade, that's the flatter one. The other one is, is yellow, that's leisure and hospitality. Together, those lines make up one-fifth of American employment or 32 million American workers. And those are the jobs that are most at risk. And in some sense, if I have any optimism uh, that comes out of this, it is that that share of America is so large that I cannot imagine that we will be, uh, that we will ever take the level of risks that we have in the past 15 years. And the size of that vulnerable block makes me at least modestly optimistic that we will actually take future pandemics seriously and make the investments that we need to to reduce future risk. Um, before COVID-19, I was deeply anxious, and I still am, about this, uh, this graph, which shows the geography of not working among prime age males in America. And as you can see, right, the, the really big numbers are in this eastern heartland of the U.S. It's relatively non-urban. It starts down in Louisiana and Mississippi and runs up through Appalachia into the Rust Belt towns of the north. These were cities that didn't have professional and business services. Um, their employment is, is dominated by healthcare, by a government-funded sector. And so they didn't have the secondary dollars which, Fred, which moved to leisure and hospitality. Um, so I, I previously was terrified that this, that this group would never find employment, whereas I was more optimistic about cities. If we don't fix pandemic, that may be reversed, or at least the urban advantage may entirely disappear. Now, the question on the table is, will COVID-19 make the world less urban? And I think I share the view of, of that Martina articulated at the beginning, which is that if pandemic persists, then surely the answer is yes. If this happens every four or five years, then I cannot imagine a world in which we will not seriously consider dis relocating significant amounts of activities. Less so perhaps in the developing world, right? Poorer places, New York continued to urbanize in the 19th century, despite the cholera epidemics, because cities were poor. That will continue to happen in the poor world as well. Um, but uh, if this persists, uh, then we will have a less urban world. Uh, I think that's a strong, helps make the strong case for, for investing enough and getting, hopefully getting lucky enough so that pandemic, this will be a rare one-off event and it will have uh, no permanent uh, impact, at least on the, on the health consequences. Um, but, you know, even then there are questions about whether or not cities will recover. And I should say that history is notably unclear about this, right? So if you think about the plague of Justinian, um, Plague of Justinian stops that emperor's attempt to rebuild a Pax Romana in the Mediterranean world in the sixth century. And essentially the appearance and reappearance of the Black Death, which is what that was, um, essentially kept Ur Europe far less urban for a millennium. Um, by contrast, the influenza epidemic of 1919, right, came and went, killed millions, but essentially the urbanization of the world continued. So, so we can't you know, think that we know what will happen, but part of the difference is that the Black Death kept on coming back and back and uh, the influenza pandemic ended. Um, cities do bring, as Diego has already said, huge Ed, you're just breaking up there, I think. Let's see, let's see for a moment whether he reconnects. <laughs> 
Okay, maybe this is a good moment to see. Let's see whether we have any few any any question we can talk about in the meantime until Ed reconnects. Diego, maybe um, we can ask you before you you need to leave for your meeting. How has the work that you've been doing with the government shifted your perspective? Has there been certain aspects as an urban economist um, that have changed your views now, looking at this through the lens of the government? Um, I think the, you know, one of the things that, I, that I've seen is that, you know, there have been people thinking about this possibility uh, for a long time, right? So, uh, this uh, committee advising the government, uh, most uh, people actually are doctors and biologists, biologists, uh, biologists, uh, uh, and you know what? What for most of us is not something we have thought about. Uh, somehow they have been seeing it coming uh, uh, for a while, right? But they also know the, know a lot precisely because of that uh, about this, right? So certainly, well, with well, with uh, come to realize this uh, a, a bit too late uh certainly you know there's this this should actually at least provide a, a focus for for keeping investing in in science and and uh especially for for doing uh policy and, and politics in a way that's science based i think this has made it uh, clear how important uh, that is right and we've talked about investments now in, in several places what did, what do you think are, are some of the key investments that cities are, are in the process of making or need to make to be more resilient um, towards pandemics in the future? Yes, so, so partly what we're discussing about uh, commuting and, and public transport and the adapting it to, uh, you know, to, to being able to use it in a time where uh, the virus and the possibility, uh, the possibility of, of contagion is, is widespread. But also thinking of uh, of more fragile places, right? So one thing we've seen almost everywhere is that nursing homes have been uh, responsible for uh, a huge percentage of, of deaths in many places. In, in many places, up to 50, 60% of the deaths are in nursing homes, right? And this is something that we realized too, too late, right? We should have protected these places from for very early on. And of course, you know, we, we didn't realize this. This is not something that one place got wrong. Almost every place got this, got this wrong. But certainly, we we've seen that nursing homes are very fragile. First responders, health workers are also in very delicate positions, right? So there, there are very localized environment uh, investments in certain sectors and certain activities that we need to make in terms of uh, protective measures, but also in terms of preparation of being able to react quickly, right? So, since it is something that uh, it's probably going to go away gradually and in waves, and we're going to, to see more of this. I think certainly we need to be prepared for that. But I think we have Ed back online. Yeah, I, I, great. I am sorry about that. The, it was a mysterious outing of the internet, reminding <laughs> of the importance of investing more broadband in rural areas. Uh, I think that's the, uh, uh, that's, that's the takeaway here. Um, okay, so I was, I was just trying to share uh, a little bit from the alignable survey and I'll go quickly and again I apologize for that but the ways of the ways of technology are often quite mysterious to me okay um, current slide the alignable survey is business we had 7500 uh, respondents they're by and large small firms so this is not representative of the US as a whole uh, but it is representative of the the share of the economy that employs 48 percent of American workers are, are in these firms with less than 500 workers um, this is the representation across the country which is fairly good um, what I can tell you is that the closure rates were extraordinary even by April 1st. So over our whole sample, 45% of firms had, shown, had closed down, 62% in tourism and lodging, 54% in restaurants. The, 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 the businesses that were particularly in the New York metropolitan area or around there were even higher. So just an enormous amount of dislocation. And as opposed to sort of large scale employers, this is a very vulnerable cluster. This is a cluster without a lot of cash. And many of them, and you can see this in the next column, have no expectation, you know, think it's quite possible that they're going to be closed in December as well. Um, we engaged in a little bit of a sort of hypothetical experiment. We sort of varied their, their prompt on thinking about how long the crisis would last. 
um, and uh, by changing it from one month to four months to six months. And for example, only 30% of the restaurants in our sample thought that they would survive at all if the crisis lasts for four months. That drops to 15% if the crisis lasts for six months. And uh, the typical firm who has more than $10,000 a month in expenses had less than two weeks worth of cash on hand. So this is a very undercapitalized uh, group. Um, America's extraordinary lending programs may have done something to, to preserve them, but it's very hard to know if, if the $650 billion was being spent uh, well. Um, just in terms of understanding the size, if this amount goes down, so if the crisis lasts for four months, based on our projections, we will have 32 million unemployed Americans just due to these small firms shutting down in December. So presumably many of them will come back uh, but the level of sort of economic Armageddon suggested by these numbers is just absolutely enormous. Um, and I, I will say that I just wanted to agree with, with something that Diego said earlier. I have often been a critic of things like universal basic income, partially because I worry so much about not inducing people, not, not inducing people to, to stay at home, making sure we have good incentives to work. We shouldn't worry about that at all now, right? We're happy with having people not working. That's entirely right. And so unconditional trash fa cash transfers during this period are entirely appropriate. Next thing about remote working. Um, we also tried to figure out how many of these firms in the Alignable survey were uh, working from home. Uh, and uh, we showed this across industries and we related this to some work that uh, Dingle and Naaman did in trying to estimate the possibility of working from home. Uh, many of you may have seen the Dingle and Naaman work. It fits remarkably well and that's what you're seeing here. This is the prediction pre-crisis of uh, Dingle and Naaman on <coughs> how likely we are to see people being able to convert to work, remote work? And the answer is that predicts extraordinarily well which sectors, at least in our data, have transitioned to remote work. Um, this now shows a different survey of the National Association of Business Economists, where we asked, how many of you think that this transition to remote work will be permanent? Um, in this case, the Dingle and Naaman work also predicts what share think that they'll be permanent. I'll just show you this, which gives you the sense of how big these numbers are in terms of you know, uh, the transition in terms of ex post working. So we asked um, what share of the firm's workers who did not work remotely before COVID-19 will do so once business returns to normal. And, you know, 36% said a fairly small number, but, you know, another solid 30% said uh, that more than 40% of them would start working from, from home. Now, I agree with what Diego said that for many jobs, you will still have robust demand for business centers. Uh, you will have robust demand for high densities at the, at the high end. And it's exactly these issues about unplanned interaction, about young workers learning and becoming skilled by being involved in this cluster. But there are many uh, more routine knowledge work tasks that can be put out and can be put to different locations. And I think because of that, almost assuredly, the next three to five years are going to be a very tough one for anyone who is interested in commercial real estate downtown. Last point I want to make, um, public transportation. So uh, it seems certainly natural to believe that high density public transportation would uh, spread the disease. Uh, it's very hard to know how big that effect is, at least with the American data. Uh, Diego's data, which is vastly better, may enable you to, to know this, but I wanna just present three, three facts which sort of make it clear about how difficult the normal methods we have are for identifying this. So first we have the positive COVID test rate per thousand across New York City zip codes. This is now regressed on the relationship between the share of workers that use public transportation. And as you can see, it is starkly negative, okay? There's no sense if you, which you look at this data and you say, boy, the high public transit usage areas are the ones that we were hit with high COVID tests. Now this is the share of people who are going to emergency rooms for respiratory or flu-like symptoms and public transit usage. And this one is strikingly positive, okay? Um, so you've got these two pieces of data and they show exactly the opposite conclusion. And I think it's very hard to, to interpret what the reality is here without actual true randomized testing. I should also suggest that this is something that's you know, evolving over time. But Diego made it clear that there are many ways in which you could imagine that public transit would not be that risky for you if handled appropriately. And of course, densities have become very low in New York public transit stops uh, since the COVID crisis started. But the last thing, and I, I that you know, to me at least the most obvious mistake that we've made in handling COVID in the United States is our failure to protect the nursing homes. And there also appears to be a link with public transit here. And here we can use the death data, which is less likely to suffer from many of these biases. This comes from work of a graduate student of mine, Karen Shen. And this is showing the share of nursing homes with an outbreak or the share of nursing homes with deaths and the, the proximity to public transit of this nursing home. And the nursing homes across the US where 60% you know, of the deaths in Massachusetts from COVID-19 have been in nursing homes. 
uh, this is highly related to sort of urban density. And so, you know, cities may be able to be made healthy for younger people easily or reasonably easily. Um, the old and the vulnerable are clearly uh, the highest risk, and we clearly did far too little to protect them during this crisis. So I, I want to end with the same sort of optimistic uh, view that Diego uh, evinced, right? I believe the cities will come back. The human capacity to gain, to benefit from interaction with other human beings is fantastic. And I think for many of us, uh, Zoom is not a perfect replica for being in person, which you just experienced right now when my Zoom went out, right? Um, but I don't think that happens freely. Pandemic has destroyed urban civilizations in the past. And we really need to take seriously the issue of stopping pandemics before they spread, having a global monitoring system, making sure that we have you know, a health system in place that can actually you know, protect people in a proper way, preemptive uh, vaccine uh, investigation, better work on virology to get on basic questions like the nature of the viral load and the spread of the disease, and as well as investing in core things which would make urban health to begin with more resilient. Um, and let me let me sort of end end with that. But um, my point about cities and inequality, which I, I guess I should say something on the last of, is that cities attract poor and rich people. The fact that cities attract poor and rich people is not something that cities should apologize for. Um, and and suburbs should never be proud of the fact that they make it impossible for poor people to come there. But that being said, the presence of so many poor people in a highly dense environment is does create vulnerabilities, and it creates an obligation for cities to invest in the things that will protect that population from the demons of density like contagion. Thank you. Great. Great, Ed. Thanks very much. Um, let's uh, hand over to Jesse now, and then we'll open up uh, the, 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 the broad Q&A to everyone. You're muted still, Jesse. Great. Well, let me just start off by um, thanking uh, Martina for the invitation um, to present and uh, um, for the presentation thus far. It's been interesting to sort of see their perspectives um, and hear some nice to hear some optimism um, from the speakers. Um, so I share my screen and assume that that's working. Um, so uh, obviously as an urban economist, I think about cities as places where people consume, work, interact with one another. Um, my research focuses on uh, um, consumption amenities and social amenities. Um, the idea that Ed first introduced of uh, cities as being you know, consumer cities. Um, so uh, today, uh, when we're thinking about COVID-19 and the future of cities, I'm really going to come at it on the question from that perspective, perhaps giving a bit more of a targeted um, perspective than the broader perspectives um, that Ed and Diego provided. Um, really thinking about how has consumption responded um, to the pandemic, and then what can we learn from these trends in consumption for the future of cities, at least in the near term, when there's still this potential threat of this pandemic. So uh, I'm going to be using for this analysis um, smartphone movement data. And uh, since this data is fairly, is all, really all over the place now, it's being used by sort of economists and uh, um, public health professionals um, uh, to um, think about where people are moving, how the disease is spreading. I'm going to provide a bit of background on the, the type of data that um, uh, I've been using with co-authors. So the data we're using is uh, processed by a company called Place IQ. Um, Place IQ accesses a subscription to uh, pings that are coming from uh, um, uh, cell phones, um, uh, the apps that people have on their cell phones. Okay. And this data, this subscription is probably what you're seeing when you're seeing um, uh, cell phone data or move, smartphone movement data being used broadly sort of in the New York Times, et cetera. Um, it's the same underlying data that, for example, SafeGraph has. So what Place IQ does with the data is that they intersect the pings that are coming from devices through their apps with polygons of establishments. And they focus on identifying visits to retail establishments because um, retailers are their primary customers in normal times as well as today. And then they also identify a lot of visits to residential locations. 
and sort of these residential visits are complementary in the sense that you can use them to identify where the devices actually live. So you see where someone lives and then you see all of the retail establishments where they're going to. Um, Place IQ, I'll just point out, is very concerned about um, uh, privacy and device user privacy and all of the analysis that I'm going to present today and the work that we've been doing um, uh, is approved sort of through an IRB review. So just to give you a sense of uh, the representativeness of these data, you might be questioning when you see um, uh, analyses showing up and around and about. Um, about who are these device users, where are they coming from, how large is the actual sample. So the sample has about 100 million different devices and uh, that accounts for maybe, you know, a quarter to a third maybe of the devices in the US. Um, it's not a complete sample, but as you can see in this plot here, it's pretty representative um, in terms of the cities that um, it's drawing devices from. So there's a pretty strong correlation between the log number of devices in a given city in the smartphone data with the, the population of, the, of a city. Um, but demographically, um, it's also pretty representative. If we look at the residential locations, the residential block groups, where these devices are being drawn from, we see, for example, on the top left, um, perhaps where the data does worse, um, that about 7% of the devices are being drawn from block groups that um, uh, are in the lowest decile of uh, um, population density. So uh, the data isn't really pulling rural areas um, as much as other areas. Um, it, it tends to oversample slightly um, lower income households, um, what, um, um, uh, um, minority households and uh, um, uh, high school educated households, just, just slightly, but pretty much it's pretty representative. So when you're looking at these data, you are getting a sense of sort of the whole US population. In terms of uh, the data we're using, where we're really focusing on retail visits, um, all of uh, the types of retail chains that you think of as being sort of your big American retail chains, are represented. So in terms of the most visited chains, you have your McDonald's, Starbucks, Burger King um, for restaurants, then retail, you have your Walmart, Walgreens, um, Dollar, Dollar General, um, etc. Um, so it's capturing sort of a pretty wide range in particular of different types of retail establishments. We're not just thinking about department stores here, we're really thinking about all of the different places that Americans go out to spend money, interact with people, um, including gyms, gas stations, grocery stores and banks. Um, bringing those two together, sort of where do people live and where are they going? The data is also fairly representative in terms of capturing what we see in national survey data of uh, the lengths of trips that um, US households take. So in red and pink, you see uh, um, that the smartphone data matches pretty well the distribution of trip lengths um, in kilometers um, with the National Household Travel Survey in high population density areas. Um, and in blue, you see the difference in low population density areas, um, where in those areas people travel longer, but the smartphone data is picking, picking up those um, trip lengths as well. So that's sort of a brief overview of the data. And then, so what are we doing with it? So my co-authors and I have been working with this data for quite a long time to answer questions about the uh, consumption um, value of cities and the interactions that cities afford um, households. And then when um, COVID emerged in March, we sort of flipped the switch a bit in our research in order to produce indexes that might be useful for um, policy-driven research related to COVID-19. So, so thus far, we've created two indexes that are publicly available. The first is a location-to-location -location matrix. So this is similar to the data that Diego was, um, was using to show that a lot of people who, that you're seeing higher um, positive testing rates in locations um, uh, that were sort of the weekender spots um, uh, to, uh, um, to Madrid. So in this matrix, what we're showing is we're showing the exposure of a given county to another county. And uh, 
we're um, specifically looking at the share of devices that are pinged, that ping in a county on a given day, that also pinged in another county in the previous 14 days. So this is capturing sort of to what extent is county A exposed to whatever um, uh, COVID positive testing rate potentially is in county B. The second um, uh, index that we've created is the device exposure index, which is more focused on um, the exposure of individual devices based on their day-to-day -day activity versus sort of their, um, uh, their longer trip, um, trips that they're taking. And so what we've done here is we're effectively trying to measure the average exposure of devices that from the other devices that they come across or who are also frequenting the commercial venues, the retail establishments that they're going to. So specifically, we count the number of distinct devices that visited any of the commercial venues that a given device also visited in a day. So if I um, go to a Starbucks to pick up a coffee and there were you know, 100 other devices that visited that Starbucks in that day, then that adds 100 devices to my um, device exposure index. We then average that across all the devices in a given county to get a sense of the average um, exposure of, uh, the, uh, um, of the devices in a county. So that's what I'm going to focus on in terms of the discussion today. So this um, uh, fairly fast moving plot is showing you how that device exposure really shut down from February um, through to April and then reopened again um, coming into May. Um, so you can see here um, the median and then the interquartile range of uh, this device exposure index over time. You can see that in sort of more regular times in you know, February and early into early March, we were seeing on average a device exposure index of around one to 200. And then that dropped down to about 50 um, pretty swiftly um, through the early, early to mid-March and has remained around 50 um, since then. So there are two things to note here. First, you see this big drop in the device exposure index. And the second is the compression of the, that interquartile range. And so this I find interesting because it's that wide dispersion in the, the amount of interactions that we're having that across, um, uh, across locations that eventually effectively different is telling us that locations are differentiated in terms of the amount of interactions and activity that you get, say, in a very densely populated urban location versus a less densely populated rural location. And we can see that through March into April and May, sort of the the experience, the you know, level of interaction that people were having became much more similar across locations. And cities in particular became less distinct in terms of the lifestyles they were affording people once people stopped going out um, to consume. Um, so this sort of brings us to where we currently are, where sort of life in cities in terms of uh, interactive consumption looks fairly similar to life in other places. And now, you know, let's think about, do we think an urban activity will return? And then if it's not going to return fully, how is this going to change um, the benefits of cities in terms of being these consumer cities, consumption locations? So one thing to think about in terms of will um, activity return or not is thinking about to what extent is it the lockdown policies that are preventing people from um, going out, to what extent are they a constraint um, versus uh, are they just in place and uh, it's more a social norm that's developed. And so once the lockdown policies are removed, people will continue to not go out. So we can analyze this um, to see whether these policies were a constraint in particular by looking at when they were put into place, how did activity change? So here we have Philadelphia County, um, where I teach at least. I live in a county next door and out in the suburbs. And you see that the lockdown policies of businesses closing and the shelter in place order that happened in um, sort of mid to late April were not the catalysts for the reduction in activity. The catalyst came at least at the point of a state of emergency where perhaps there was that information 
of uh, the risk of going outside and interacting. And so in Philadelphia, you had uh, your device exposure dropping by, you know, to about a quarter of its original level after that state of emergency. More broadly, we can run an event study to look at essentially the coincidence of these policies with the drops in exposure. And you see that more broadly across cities or across um, all counties in the US, the state of emergency um, happened typically before the drop. Um, uh, the drop in uh, this activity was coincident with the shelter in place orders and the non-essential business closure orders, which um, typically happened um, at the same time. Less so with school closures. Obviously, um, these events are potentially correlated with the social norms already. So one way to control for that is by using cross-state variation in the policies themselves and uh, looking within commuting zones under the assumption that the social norms and the changing trends in social norms were shared by counties on either side um, of a state border that share the same commuting zone. So here I'm thinking about, say, people who live in Camden versus people who live in Philadelphia County, um, and uh, the lockdown occurred earlier in Philadelphia versus Camden, but we were all sharing the same um, sense of, um, of fear in terms of going out. And once you um, control for this, um, for these commuting zone trends, you do see that the shelter in place orders did have some effect and potentially the non-business closures did have some effect, at least in the short term. So um, uh, that's indicating that there is some, there was some role play by the lockdown policies in uh, um, shutting down activity. But now that activity is shut down, are we into a mode of uh, um, lockdown um, uh, and a social norm of not going out and not seeking um, these interactions such that once businesses are reopened and the shelter in place ends, we still won't go out. And so let's take this example of Atlanta, Georgia, which um, was one of the sort of the earliest um, states um, to reopen. And you see it around this business reopening and um, date and shelter in place ending date. You don't see that much of an increase really, at least in that county of uh, um, uh, the device exposure index. Um, if we look across all uh, um, uh, different counties or states that have uh, um, uh, relieve their shelter in place orders. Again, looking within commuting zones, you see some um, trend, upward trend in activity after the, uh, um, uh, after the date that non-essential businesses were allowed to reopen, but it's very noisy. And you might think that this noise is created by sort of the Atlanta example of people not going out. But what is interesting is I think the noise is equally created by examples such as Philadelphia County, where we saw a big spike in people going out again. We saw the DEX was originally to around 200, it dropped to around 50, and it's jumped up now to have an average around 100 again, to be half of its original level, um, even without any shelter in place being removed. Essential businesses, non-essential businesses haven't reopened in Philadelphia County, yet people are going out again. So there are sort of these social norms moving in both directions, um, meaning that we're not necessarily, that we could be potentially more optimistic depending on your view in terms of people wanting to get out, um, at least once it's safe, and what's, or once they perceive it to be safe, or people not wanting to go out. So, um, so this leaves us with the question of uh, if activity does remain muted, at least to some extent, um, how will cities change? So a lot of my work over the past um, 10 or so years has been thinking about differences in the experience of cities and the draw of cities to high and low income households, the college educated versus the non-college educated. And particularly, I've been studying um, why have the college educated been moving back to the, um, US cities, to downtowns. And so looking at these differences in uh, um, the experience of cities, right, we see, uh, you know, confirming uh, the work that Victor Couture and I have, that indeed, um, here we have uh, high income households do uh, have higher device exposure indexes in normal times. Their um, uh, 
they're experiencing more interactions. They're going to the Soul Cycle um, spinning class and coming across, you know, a number of other devices in all of these ser um, services that they're um, uh, partaking in. Once um, COVID hit, that all stopped. So life changed in terms of uh, um, uh, device exposure or interactions more for the high income for the, than for the low income who started off with a lower degree of um, level of interactions. And here you saw sort of, even if there hasn't been a democratization in terms of income levels and of health, I mean, in terms of sort of day-to-day -day lives of most people um, and the number of devices people are you know, coming into contact with, that has um, pretty much equalized. So this is Philadelphia County. Um, here we have uh, the um, a college educated versus non-college educated. We're looking at the top devices that are coming from the um, most college educated census block groups versus the least college educated census block groups. And here is where you start seeing the, those essential workers who are coming from the non-college educated group are actually continuing to go out and put themselves at risk where the college educated households are you know, they're not going to soul cycle anymore to their spin classes um, and they don't have to go to work. They can work from home. So in terms of looking forward, um, you know, this would tend to indicate that you're going to have those highly educated households potentially staying home more, perhaps not being as attracted to the um, uh, consumption externalities of cities. But then when we had in Philadelphia, at least the spike in activity, the spike is being driven by those um, higher income college educated households. So there's, there's still an open question there. And then finally, um, thinking across cities in terms of which cities are going to change the most versus others. I think there's going to be some difference. This is looking again at that, that Dingle and Neiman um, work at home measure. You can see CBSAs, where more work can be done at home had a larger drop in their device exposure than CBSAs where less work can be done at home. So you have New York over here and the villages Florida where you have a lot of essential workers going to those nursing homes um, up in the top left here. Um, so I think it's going to be those cities that have a lot of tech jobs, for example, perhaps finance jobs that can be done from home versus perhaps EDS and NEDS um, those cities, you might see people remaining um, in cities in the near term. Um, so um, just to sum up, um, COVID-19 has drastically reduced the amount of interactive consumption um, that's taking place across US counties and really brought the amount of interactive consumption in cities to be more aligned with the amount of interactive consumption in perhaps more rural areas. Um, the re reduction is associated with policy constraints, but there's some indication that social norms are playing a large role as well. And if these norms or the policies persist, the recent influx in, of high income and college educated households might reverse, um, and particularly in centres for industries that are more remote friendly. So I encourage anyone who's interested in doing research or using these indexes um, uh, to pull them from our GitHub. So thanks very much. Okay, great. Thanks, Jesse, very much. Um, super interesting to look at these data and actually see, um, I think they're really fascinating, um, how people are, are reacting. And I guess as economists, we're not quite used to working with such up-to-date data. So it's really um, very, very nice. One, um, I'm just going to go through the questions that have been coming in. I'll try to cluster them in groups. So there's a question I think that um, talks to some of the work just you've been doing on consumption in cities, um, but it's a very broad and important question asked by Sarah Mitchell. And she's saying one of the challenges cities face right now is ensuring sufficient supply, particularly supply of food. Um, the meat industry, meat processing industry in the US is highly centralized and shutdowns due to coronavirus have caused meat shortages in supermarkets and oversupply of meat on farms. Will decentralization and even potential deglobalization of supply chains be important in ensuring the sustainability of cities in the future? Um, I'm opening it up to, to both of us. I'm happy to do, come, but you can go ahead, Jesse. Um, I was just going to say um, the work I've done on food deserts, um, one of the, the um, one of actually the 
constraints in that work is that a lot of that the work that we were doing was about urban food deserts and the differences between sort of the accessibility of food for sort of high income areas within cities versus low income areas. It's real, really rural areas that are facing so that face very large food shortages or shortages in the accessibility of healthy food. So it's those rural areas that have uh, um, uh, that are now only served by say the Dollar General store. Um, uh, so uh, you know, yes, they have uh, the opportunity to sort of grow their own food, I guess, in those um, um, rural areas. But I think I'm not sure that it will necessarily sort of, you know, be a, a, an impediment more for urban areas than rural areas, per se. Yeah, I share that view. I mean, there, during the crisis, there are two things that have gone wrong in the, in the food supply chain. One of which, which is primarily a richer world issue, are the problems of infection in the food processing plants, as your, as your comment uh, uh, said. Um, that highlights an issue which I had not been aware of, which is the fact that these manufacturing plants are actually very high density relative to other forms of manufacturing. So they're, you know, typically at least double the density of the durable goods manufacturing. And that's, that's what makes it so easy to spread in these plants. Now, I think going forward, that can more or less be handled. It can be handled both by, by de-densifying the food processing plants and by using things like, you know, blue shifts, white shifts on alternating weeks to try and lo lower the risk of, of infection. Um, and I think that'll happen. That may mean that your chicken costs more. Uh, that's probably going to be an outcome for that. But it, that problem can be, can I think, be handled reasonably uh, in a reasonable, straightforward way. In the developing world, it's actually a whole problem of the food supply chain. Um, and in part because the, the sort of wealthy world model can be made relatively hygienic to ship the goods. And in general, like shipping goods is just a lot easier than shipping people if you're worried about contagion. And you can do that in a relatively safe way. In the developing world, there are a whole lot of weaknesses in the supply chain that involve person to person interactions that are hard to make. Uh, hygienic. And this was, of course, exacerbated by the fact that, so for example, Uganda in the early days of the lockdown shut down all travel, including food transit, right? So that's, that's going to make it sort of a, a complete national breakdown, put the risks of, of famine that are pretty high. So I, I think this is something to worry about, particularly in the developing world. But I think that the, in terms of the problems that we face going forward, I think that the food supply chain is not likely to be one of the most important ones. Okay. I want to talk touch upon an issue that we haven't talked so much and that's governance and, and investments that are necessary. So there are two questions, one by Donald O'Brien, and I'm apologizing to everyone whose name I'm not pronouncing correctly, and Joe Panama. So one asks about whether anyone have you looked at how cities are governed. So some cities exist in highly centralized governmental systems, London, Paris, while others exist in more federalized governmental systems, Germany, US, Switzerland, and how that affected their response. And the second related question is what happens to badly needed public infrastructure or investment projects in cities? So person mentions transit and housing. If we're faced with the austerity budgets, the governments are likely to implement as a result of the pandemic. Should the case be made that austerity will increase inequality and poor health care and therefore worsen outcomes from future pandemics? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think austerity was never practiced in the US and it's certainly not likely to happen coming forward. I would expect the larger danger is that we will spend, you know, possibly trillions of dollars on poorly chosen infrastructure projects rather than the reverse. Um, so I think it is important for economists to weigh, weigh in on that. Um, but obviously austerity would be a huge mistake anywhere at this point in time. Um, I, I would be surprised given the amount of human suffering that's going on right now. Uh, if, if even the European, even the tougher European countries will have, will have it in them to impose austerity uh, on, their, on their systems. Um, and I think, you know, we're likely, I think, to see a fair amount of investment. In terms of the governance question, at least in the US, what happened was uh, essentially the, the, local, uh, the local authorities lost their autonomy. So you may have seen, if you were watching, like, say, for example, New York, the governor, Andrew Cuomo, basically took on everything. Same thing happened in Massachusetts. And in the US, it's constitutionally very easy for states to take over cities. And, and that's basically what happened. So, that, so the local government was basically subsumed. So the usual problem of localities fighting with each other disappeared just because the state took over control uh, during the emergency. And we saw this repeated place and place again, where sort of the highest level of government often tried to make a, make, impose their will. And certainly one of the things that we think about in the developing world is the extent to which extreme lockdowns were favored by, uh, let's say, political actors who were interested in expanding their authority as much as possible. 
Jesse, do you want to weigh in on that or? No, I would, uh, I think I would only say, uh, you know, for the US in terms of austerity, um, that's real, I think that's really yet to be seen. I think we'll see that over the next six months or so in terms of if the additional bridge funding that goes um, goes to states, you know, what constraints that comes with in terms of, uh, you know, um, where that goes. Okay, um, we have a question by Mila stiglitz Courtney. What might COVID mean for the future of cultural and social spaces in cities, museums, restaurants, bars? That's you, Jesse. You're the big. You're yeah, the. You're the uh... It's not. It doesn't. It doesn't look great. <laughs> um, I think I have to say, um, in part because uh, you know there are these restrictions in place now, but I do think you know it's this whole uh, until there's a vaccine and until. Uh, you know, people trust one another. Um, I don't think we're going to, uh, um, and, uh, you know, trust people they don't know to make that interaction, uh, you know, the benefit of that interaction um, outweigh the cost of that interaction. Um, uh, I don't think people are going to be, uh, you know, visiting these places or traveling. That's the worst part, I think. There's a lot, yeah, of, cities depend a lot on tourism and people aren't going to be getting on planes or going to conferences, things like that. I mean, certainly in our data, arts and entertainment had the highest closure rate of all the clusters that we had, uh, followed, of course, by restaurants. Um, looking forward, the restaurants were the most vulnerable because they've got the least cash, uh, but arts and entertainment also have high projections of being closed uh, going forward as well. Um, so it's a, difficult, it's a difficult setting. Yeah. Um, there's a question by Vincent Thorne. What are some transport policies cities around the world are or could implement in order to limit within city spread? Could that affect transportation in cities in the future? Um, is that, is that, that, that sounds like it's a medical question, uh, not uh, in terms of the, 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 the policies that public transit authorities are following are you know, they differ. Diego talked about one of them, the protective screens. Uh, I know New York engages in uh, disinfection every three days. Boston does it every day. Uh, it's, it's hard for us as economists to, to say exactly what, what needs to happen, but, you know, some form of social distancing, probably protective masks. Um, but, you know, we're, we're going to need to, in those cities that are dependent upon public transportation, we're going to need to figure out how to make those, those subways safe. And yeah, whatever, think, whatever it takes to do that is going to be necessary. Maybe one, one way the question was asked, um, whether there will be shifts in the mode of transportation, so a shift to even more biking schemes or, or, or types that are, are able to be done at so safer distances. Uh, it's possible. So there are some parts of the world in which shifting to bicycles are a plausible thing. I think for older Americans, uh, the likely mode is cars, uh, that you move, you move from... Uh, uh, subways or, or buses to cars whenever possible. So I, I think it's unlikely to create a renaissance in or even more bike riding in, in New York. It's more likely to that the sort of older people who are most at risk from this are going to be transitioning to, to automobile usage. Yeah. Um, Javier martinez Sala is asking, to what extent do you view these changes temporary or structural and longer lasting? It's the difficult question. Um, but what's your what's your view when you think about them? It, it all depends upon how permanent the pandemic is, right? I mean, if we if this is the first of of multiple pandemics that reappear every five years, then we're looking at a different world. Um, if this is a one off event, then assuredly there will be short term shocks. You know, we may in fact see some firms that discover that remote working works better for them, or there's a changing social norm around it. But I would bet that if this is a one-off event, we'll get more or less back to where we were in 2019. Um, so I think I think it all comes back down to the disease. Okay. Um, I agree. I think I just add there that um, there's also something that you know the pandemic is accelerating. It might feel permanent, but I think you know the trends of the pandemic is accelerating. With I think you know trends that were in place already, the trends that it's reversing. Um, uh, for example, potentially with higher income people moving to the suburbs, I think that will reverse, you know, once the health um, crisis is resolved. Okay, great. Maybe I can ask you one final question um, that is talking about shifting preferences for health, house sizes versus um, centrality and what do you think is doing um, 
is that doing to the house price gradient? It's one of the questions. We and have guess, some anecdotal evidence on this. Uh, I mean, we, we know that in fact, South Boston real estate is in trouble relative to s suburbs right now, but that's at a very high end level in terms of the, the properties that we're talking about. Um, I would suspect that most, most real estate prices will be down in the foreseeable future. I mean, we've had an, an enormous economic shock. Um, there might be some gradient going forward. It sort of also depends upon how permanent pandemic is as well. But on some basic level, uh, I mean, I, I subscribe to the, you know, the, the Jesse Hanbury view that these urban amenities are, are just a pretty powerful draw. And for most of the younger generations, having an urban apartment and then sharing space with other people will strongly continue to be the preferred mode of existence as long as the pandemic risk uh, recedes. And so, I mean, uh, in the short run, sure, all sorts of dislocations are likely to occur. But in the longer run, assuming that we make the investments we need to, I think that city living will continue and will be as exciting as it has been for many decades. I think that's a very positive note. Jesse, do you want to say something? I, yeah, I agree. I think that in the, in the very near term, then you might see uh, people moving to the suburb, you know, moving you know, to the suburbs or spending time there. But I don't think that we're going to see, uh, you know, that, you know, bigger declines in prices than you would in a usual downturn happening in more inelastic places or in cities. I would, if you take, if you take Jesse's stuff seriously, one of the things on this, one of the things that you want to think about is residential may well be more robust than commercial. So the commercial stuff that can be outsourced is, has less, is less tied to this. And so that's, I would be worrying about the sort of, you know, you know, the, the mid range of commercial in large cities seems, seems like it's particularly vulnerable in the, in the short term. Okay, great. So we're approaching the end of this webinar and I'm sure everyone is extremely busy. So I would like to thank our panelists again for taking time out of their uh, really busy schedules to participate. And thanks to the audience for, for joining us. We've seen there's a, there are a lot of open questions on how COVID-19 will affect cities um, from how, where people will live, work and consume across space. I think overall, the panel kind of the, the view that's emerging from the panel is that the the productivity advantages that pool will remain I think Diego made a very strong argument for the fact that being face to face uh, will not cease and um, Jesse and and um, Ed making it a point that the consumption amenities of cities uh, will draw people back in of course all of this will hinge on 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 the permanence the depth and as well the frequency um, going forward of, of pandemics. If you would like to watch certain parts of the webinar again or share the link, you can access the live recording on www.tcd.ie forward slash TRIS or forward slash economics. And the next event in the series is on the 26th of May and it will be on how COVID will affect travel and tourism. And with this, I wish you all a good rest of the day and that you all stay safe and healthy. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Martina. Thank you.